this is, not, this is going to be one of the more difficult talks that I have given, not because of the things that I'm about to share, but because of the things that I need to keep to myself. And you might be asking, like, why, what, what is she talking about? <laughs> right. So I'm a keynote speaker on KubeCon stage in two days. And my research team and I've been working relentlessly on this report, this thought leadership article, on top publicly available containers on Docker Hub. And in the last couple of weeks, we are burning the midnight oil. And I'll be sharing those results right after we publish the report online tomorrow. On stage, I'll be talking about the high-level insights. But I wish this conversation was a couple days after that point, so that we do a first principles deep dive into the findings and talk about what we found in that research. But today is not going to be that day. My growth team didn't allow me to share a lot of those insights. The cool thing is that I would like to give you a, an insight into the journeys that we embarked upon. And we have published the same report last year, so I'll talk about that a little bit. And I'm going to share some insights. So being a data scientist, I did some sneaking into and, and pulled some clusters in the data set, some samples. That will signal the findings. So we will go into that. So I, I, I know that I, I might be able to get you excited about that, but my hope is that you download that report and maybe come to uh, the KubeCon keynotes so that you can hear the messenger. I, like my goal for, for that speak is basically just get out of the mail of the me message because I think, you know, I don't say this very lightly, but um, this time I think data speaks for itself. Before I go into any detail, I would like to talk a little bit about myself and Slim AI, the company, the startup that I work for. Before I do that, though, can I see a show of hands? How many of you have heard about Slim AI or Docker Slim? Wow, impressive. Several people. So Slim AI, or maybe I should start with Docker Slim because that's our open source genesis, our DNA. Docker Slim is a popular uh, GitHub project on container optimization. It has been on GitHub for about seven years right now. A lot of stars, they have passed 15,000 stars a while ago. And again, it is our open source genesis and DNA. With Slim AI, we take this technology and we build upon it. This is this core foundation that we are extending, making it simpler, more, um, it's more secure, layered, and more efficient with Slim AI, our SaaS platform. At Slim, we are scanning hundreds of thousands of containers regularly. This year alone, we have seen more than 900,000 unique containers in our SaaS platform. And as a data scientist working with this data, and my research team doing the same. We observe these containers, we deconstruct them. We try to understand what makes these containers developer friendly and production ready. So last year, around this time, we published this report, Slim AI Top Public Containers Report 2021. And I will go into the details a little bit, and again, I'm going to show, talk about the delta between then and now, uh, but before, Doing that, I would like to say something about the data. So this is the type of data that, again, as a data scientist, I really enjoy because it's dry, hard, cold facts. Right? I can go into the system, pull the data, look into the trends and whatnot. But for me, although data is beautiful, it's decision intelligence that matters. And for that, you need to look into the people and the processes the data that data's impact on people. To be able to do that, this year we partnered with a research firm, Dimensional Research, and we carried out this survey, this global randomized survey, asking questions to developers and DevOps engineers. And being a data scientist, looking at people, I see data points. I'm joking. I would like to ask some of the questions that we asked to those developers to you, and I would love to hear your um, opinions on that. 
I would basically like to take that survey to a test drive before we go into the technical results. So the first question that we asked, there are multiple, but I picked a few, was this one. And it's a, it's a simple, soft one. Would you like to know more about containers than you do today? And it is more about, you know, it might, it might start from a very simple conceptual understanding of containers, but deeper understanding of container slimming and hardening, how containerization works uh, at scale, understanding these things. We were, we were looking for these things. But I would love to hear your answer on this one. So repeating the question, would you like to know more about containers than you do today? Or you think your knowledge is pretty good already? Okay. Some, some people want to learn more. 92% of the people that we asked admitted that they would like to learn more about containers. And this one is the sequel to that question, which was eye-opening to me, because I realized that, you know, this question that I, I would like to read here right now, it says, which of the following do you fully understand about containers? And you can see that most of the developers said they conceptually understand how containers work, um, container deployment, creating containers and whatnot, but it, when it comes to more advanced topics, like all the components within a container or um, container orchestration, those percentages start dropping down. And when, it, when you know, we were asking about the hardening and slimming of containers, only one in four developers said they understand these areas fully. Another question. Did your company ever use publicly available containers? Can I see a show of hands? Publicly available containers, okay. Less than what I saw in the data, but 66% of the developers that we asked said yes, we still do. 15% uh, said yes, we don't use them anymore, but we did use them in the past, and only 19%, less than 20 said, no, we have deployed, developed all of our containers in-house. Next one, we are getting close. In your experience, is it challenging to ensure containerized applications are free from vulnerabilities? What would you say? Removing vulnerabilities from containers. Okay, some. This was an overwhelming yes in the survey. People said it's hard to remove these, these, uh, these uh, issues from the containers. I will actually, I want to fast forward to this. This one, people said the complexity of these containers, the numerous components with dependencies in these containers was the number one contributing factor for why these vulnerabilities uh, were hard to deal with. You know, others mentioned that it takes a lot of time. Other, some people mentioned manual processes. Actually, this one, the manual processes one was interesting because more than 50% of the developers who answered said they are removing, slimming, hardening their containers via these manual processes. And one last question, this is, this is something that I, there's a lot of discussion in the industry about this one. Some people that it's, uh, um, it's a land that's out of reach. Some others think that it should be enforced. But I would like to ask you and get your opinion. What are your customers or other end users demanding that your containers have zero vulnerabilities? Can I see a show of hands? Customers asking for zero vulnerabilities in their containers? Very few. OK. In the survey, um, it said that 70 percent of the people said, yes, people are and users, whether it's other departments in our company or our customers, they're asking for zero vulnerabilities. So let's move forward to the research that we have done. So this is more of the hard, like hard uh, core quantitative analysis part. So what we did with this one, before I go into the details and the results, I would like to give you a quick overview of the methodology. So we went into Docker Hub and pulled the top 165 containers. And you might think that's a very small sample size. After all, in Docker Hub, 
there are more than 10 million images with more than 320 billion pool volume, right? So 165 may seem like a handful. But these containers together are a huge sample size in terms of the pool count, but because they account for more than 30% of the pool volume. But there are certain containers in the sample size, in the sample set, that has been pulled by five, six, seven billion times. Okay. After we pulled them, the latest versions of them, we created them into nine different categories. And you can see some of them in that uh, circular diagram that are maybe it's too small, but we have programming languages, general purpose categories, and the spatial purpose categories like local development, infra, um, and, and data science type, like you know, high level categories. And we scan them using standard open source tools. I have some of my favorites there, Encore, I'm a huge fan. I use their Docker extension too the uh, SIFT and the GRIPE tools for SBOM and vulnerability analysis. We used Docker Slim's X-ray tool. And the, the questions that we were trying to answer was that, are these containers easy to use? Are they efficient and safe? And will they cause any issues when we push them to production with our applications? Okay. And we've been looking into these regularly, scanning them every day, looking into a time series analysis, how the vulnerabilities are evolving in these, in these containers uh, regularly. But at that time, here were the high level findings. Okay? The first one was that there was this perfect correlation between the scan times of these containers and their sizes. Okay? For every 500 megabytes added to the system, we were seeing 50 seconds longer scan times. And if it is a few containers being shipped by a developer every now and then, that's one thing. But we know that scale changes everything. Right? If I ask you to buy me a pint of ice cream, that's one thing. If I ask you to buy me 20 million of them by next Monday without letting any one of it melt, it's a different problem. So at scale, these things start mattering. The second finding was about the complexity in these containers. Okay. So there are a few box plugs charts on the right-hand side. Um, and we are looking into spatial permissions, libraries, packages in these containers. Let's do a deeper dive in one of them, the packages. So you can see on the x-axis here, I'm showing programming languages, web development, all these different categories that we have. On the uh, y-axis, you see the number of packages in these different container categories. And you can see that it is not just the outliers, but even the averages are surprisingly high. And if you think about this, right, you know, in um, programming languages category, for example, the average package size is about 350, right? This number is supposed to be the tip of the iceberg. Because there are studies, I'm sure you might remember, there's this one, but there are multiple studies like that. This one is from the Darmstadt University 2019 research where they looked into a specific ecosystem, the NPM ecosystem. And they said the package reach of the top five packages was between 134,000 and 166,000 dependencies, other packages. So a single package, it's one of the top, obviously, might have 100,000 other packages. So a container having 400 packages, right, each one having thousands, in certain cases, hundreds of thousands of dependencies, you realize that the tip of the iceberg is an iceberg in this case. And maybe one note to make here about the packages. You might think um, that I am proposing that we should be removing these packages, these tools from these containers. I don't think in those terms. I think they make the developers' lives really easy. It makes it very experimental, fun to work with these containers. You can 
test and deploy and, and build applications uh, in more easier ways with these types of tooling. But the problem is that they also represent an attack surface, and it implies a need to automatically remove these things, especially if they are redundant to the system. Otherwise, they will make it to production. Okay? So the point that I'm making here is that if you don't make the conscious effort to remove these unnecessary, redundant packages, we will be incurring tech debt down the road. The third learning was building upon the category, this packages category, is the vulnerabilities. So I'm not going to talk about the vulnerability count right away because you know that, and there are security experts, I'm sure. I have spent a lot of my career in cybersecurity industry myself. Attack surface is more than a vulnerability count. There are the, 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 root, the user's permissions that we were just talking about, right? If the user is root, that can create a ton of issues. We talked about packages. There might be a ton of other issues that are important for an attack surface. But I'll say this. Even the average count of vulnerabilities and the outliers obviously were too high was concerning to me. In fact, you know, some of these having 2,000 vulnerabilities, like I was looking at these and I, I, I thought, if a DevOps engineer has to ship some of these containers, why should they even start, right? So we looked into the severity categories of these vulnerabilities and realized that 20% of the vulnerabilities were belonging to a high or critical severity category. My expectation was not more than five, and it was 20%. And this year, and I can't give you numbers, but it grew up, it increased significantly. But you can see that across all categories, from web development to programming languages, there are a lot of critical and high severity level, um, high severity vulnerabilities, except the base OS one, which um, has you know, some vulnerabilities, but definitely not the critical and high categories that we had here. So focusing on one of those categories, the programming languages, right? This category seemed to be very much in line with the averages that we were seeing. So not necessarily the most vulnerable, you know, high in terms of package counts and whatnot, but also not innocent as well. So let me pull a few things and start comparing 2020 to 2021 um, with respect to the, the, the last year. So I pulled Golang, Node, Python, Rust. I could have pulled many more. Are these in line with like, the things that you work with? Is there any other programming languages that you would love to see in such a comparison, for example? Or are these interesting enough? Good? OK. So if you look into it, like, I, I am um, just showcasing the number of vulnerabilities year over year, so 2021 versus 2022, between Golang, Node, Rust, and Python, as I said. As you can see, the only one that seemed to have improved slightly is no, not slightly. It seems, it seems substantial. The other ones, Python has increased by about 50%. Um, Rust increased by about 50%. Golang increased by 20%. So all of them have more vulnerabilities. And it is not as if we haven't seen certain incidents, CVEs, resolved from the system. So for each and every one of them, we have seen that certain CVEs were being removed, but there were more CVEs, three, four, five times more in this subset, three times more, getting added into the system. So our remediation rate is much slower than the one that our detection, detection rate for, for these containers. This is looking into the severity levels of that one. And I would like us to focus on, I hope you can see the details here, but what we have is it's the same order. What we have is Golang um, and Node on top. 2022, um, this time we are looking into the percentages of these uh, vulnerabilities that we have seen. And you can see, for example, we said Node has less this year. So look into the 2021 vulnerability distribution for Node, and you will see that there are a lot of um, low and uh, negligible category 
vulnerabilities. And if you look at this year, the high and critical level of, uh, of uh, vulnerabilities has tripled. So in a year, yes, Node made progress in terms of removing a ton of the vulnerabilities, but then we also added three times more high and critical vulnerabilities, um, which you know, puts a shadow onto the improvement that we made. Others, others were already, you said, they have seen more vulnerabilities, some results, but a lot more has been added. And when you look into a, you know, Python, for example, the percentages of these critical high incidents, medium incidents, they are also much higher than compared to last year. So the main conclusion, like, and I can give you a deeper dive later on when we publish that report, but the main conclusion that I had here was that even when you look into specific categories with very strong communities, sometimes um, a, a container that has a strong enterprise behind them, we do not see a lot of improvements, especially for this category, programming languages in general. I can say that we are no more secure than we were in 2021. And this is in the aftermath of multiple security incidents last year and an intense focus on software supply chain security. Now, I'm hopeful that as an industry, we will be making the right decisions and the conversations have started. And I do think that this container landscape is providing a ton of opportunities to the developers in terms of scale. But you can see that it is also presenting certain risks. Was there a question? OK. And we will be doing more and deeper research, hopefully leading to actionable research. But I feel like we, we need to start thinking a lot more about how to improve as an industry. What do we want as an industry? Right? Our customers want zero vulnerabilities or get close to that dreamland. Our developers want to enjoy and uh, enjoy coding, not be overwhelmed by infrastructure. They should not need a PhD in infrastructure and understand every little detail, all the complexities of these containers. But we also want to push production-ready containers to production. So to be able to do that, for us at Slim, we think you should know what's inside your containers and push only what's needed to production. We believe in automation through intelligent optimization, and we are seeking to solve this problem for all of the world's containers. And there are other teams with different approaches, and they're relentless and brilliant, and they are putting, they're losing their sleep over these problems. And because of that, I'm very hopeful about the future. I'm hopeful, but I'm concerned. I think this is troubling that you know after this much conversation, the um, direction is not heading in the right direction. But again, I do think that the more we talk about these, especially with these decision intelligence points, these analytical um, insight, we will be making better improvements. So with that, thank you so much for listening to me. I would love to hear more of your comments. Um, online, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Let's connect and continue the conversation. Thank you so much for your time and looking forward to connect in the conference. Can you take one question? Yes, Very I think we have time. First off. Thank you. While the number of vulnerabilities is increasing, um, there's the argument that only so many vulnerabilities are exploitable. Naturally, the number is growing, the growth is proportional. Do you have any data or guidance around exploitability and better understanding which ones would be exploitable, which ones wouldn't be, and just better understanding and how to, how to produce that as we get into the future. That's a great point. So not all vulnerabilities are created equal, and some of them might not be even exploitable. I definitely agree with this. Like I have seen certain vulnerabilities, certain packages being in different paths in a container, for example, right? The same package can be represented in the same container in 40 different pathways. 
and the same package might have, like several different packages have the same CVEs. That, that same CVE in a different package, in a different runtime, represents a whole different risk level. So even that, even the same CVE, even the same package might have a different security rating in a container itself. So it's a very nuanced, detailed problem. But try selling that idea to a government, a Department of Defense in any government saying, hey, you know what? We have 1,000 vulnerabilities here, but we don't think it's exploitable. You, we might not think it's exploitable, but we know that they are there. It's uncomfortable, and there might be in the future certain issues. So I know, I have a feeling that customers, governments, will be demanding more of this. But we need to have a nuanced understanding of what matters, and especially we need to understand what's the highest priority so that we can make some progress, right? If you go into a container as a DevOps engineer and see 2,000 vulnerabilities, 40% high and critical, where do you even start? Like, which ones should I start removing? And it is not the one container that you need to work with in a company. There are, you know, in our survey, we asked questions about the scale. There can be 400, 4,000, 400,000 containers in an environment Right? And everything is changing all the time. Software is a living organism. So to be able to do that at scale becomes a huge issue. Without prioritization, saying I'm going to have zero vulnerabilities, period, I don't think you can make any, anything work for you. But that's a great question. Can I take one more question, maybe? Yep. No? Yep. One? OK. Any other questions? Go ahead. So the question is, we have seen 20% in the previous report, critical and high category vulnerabilities in these containers. How did we go about scanning and finding them, labeling them? Yeah, in the, depending on which scanner you use, you get different results. <laughs> oh my god. I have pulled my hair so many nights just like trying to figure that question out. I'm so glad that you asked. So many different, so there are certain scanners that don't even reveal certain CVEs. Some others do, you know, some people say like, you know, overcounting things, just like looking at the CV and the same package, different pad as a different incident count, which I think shows the effort. It's an occurrence, but it's not necessarily a, a unique CVE. So these scanners need to be standardized. Hopefully we will do that soon, because I have, again, spent so much time to understand, compare these. We have used, we, we are putting that into our Slim AI platform so that you can easily diff these vulnerability scanners. Um, but you can see those diffs can be huge. So same container might have, you know, 1,000 vulnerabilities in one and 2,500 in another. And they're both correct. And sometimes you need to take a step back and understand. But you don't have the time to do this because we just talked about the scale issue, right? We need to standardize these for sure. I think I understand how each and every scanner works from a design perspective. So I used Gripe, Trivi, several tools, like all the things that, that you know, the usual suspects. I understand their design principles, but they are very different from each other. And it's a headache. That's my answer, I guess. <laughs> Thank you.